Good morning, Viola. Um, welcome to SGA Chapel. Today, um, just a few members of SGA are going to be sharing their stories and then kind of just talking about um, an attribute of God that they see um, in that story. So I'm going to start off today. Um, my name is Olivia. Um, I work on campus uh, for SGA, SMU, and SPA, and I'm the Vice President of Administrative Services. So basically, I'm just like an office manager, um, and kind of my focus this year has been trying to make the office um, just like a more welcoming place for everyone on campus. Um, but before I started in this job, uh, I was an office assistant, um, or an OA, that's like what everyone calls us in the office. And um, before becoming an OA, like I had never really set foot in the office at all. I was too nervous, kind of just thought like, oh, like it's not for me. I'm a commuter, and so it was really hard for me to get um, involved on campus, and I didn't really have like a group of people. Um, so um, a friend just had encouraged me one day to, to apply for a position on SGA or SMU, so I went to an info night. And I heard the office assistants um, from that, like the previous year, talking about their jobs. And um, what really stuck out to me was just that they talked about their role as being encouragers and, um, and being like a friendly first face to just anyone who came in and um, just like really supporting the staff. And that totally spoke to me. And I was like, I'm good at encouragement. Like, I can do that. So, um, so I applied. And um, I got an interview. And I... Uh, it took a lot just for me to walk in the office and, and like approach the desk and be like, hi, I'm here for my interview. And um, it was 10 a.m. and I found out that I was 12 hours early, <laughs> that it was actually supposed to be at 10 p.m. And I was like so embarrassed and I kind of like walked out with my tail between my legs and just thought like, oh my gosh, who the heck is gonna hire like a girl for an office assistant position that can't read an email? <laughs> um, so. I was like feeling bad about that and just like, bummer, you know, I, I guess like I'm not supposed to get this job. And in hindsight, I was being like way too hard on myself. Um, but right after that, uh, I walked into the nursing department, my nursing major, and, um, and there was this family that was like frantically running around trying to find like someone for a meeting and, and I went up to them and just like offered help and kind of eased them. and took them where they were supposed to go, um, just assured them, like, don't worry that you're a few minutes late, like, it's going to be great, told them all about Bayola, why they should come, and, like, right as I said goodbye, I just kind of laughed to myself, and I was like, man, like, how, how like, dumb was I to just think, I can't get this job because I made some stupid little mistake. I felt like God was, first of all, telling me, like, chill out, and second of all, he was saying, like, if you don't get this job, it's not going to be because you like aren't equipped and can't be an office assistant. Like look at what you just did. Like you just totally ministered to this family and just encouraged them and kind of like sent them on their way. Um, so um, I ended up going back for the interview and I found out a few, later, a few days later that I got the job. Um, and that turned out to be one of the biggest blessings uh, for me. Um, I kind of mentioned earlier just like having a hard time on campus my first three years here. Um, and just not really having a place to call home, um, not really having a, a community uh, of close friends around me. And with this job, God so provided um, a, a staff that I felt like I was so specifically put on at just the right time. Um, they consistently pointed me towards Christ, and they still do, and have just been like an amazing sense of support to me um, in a season that was like definitely my hardest in the nursing program and just difficult um, for like so many other reasons. But um, what I wanted to encourage you guys with is that the Lord is gracious and that he provides, um, that he knows exactly what each of us needs and he provides it in exactly the right time. Um, if this year and last year taught me anything, it's that God can be trusted. Um, he provides what we need right in the moment we need it, and he's always gracious, even when our way sounds better. Like, I think, I totally wish that God would have given me that group of friends, like, right from the get-go, and he totally could have, but he chose not to, and um, when I received that, like, that kind of home and that community here on campus, um, 
it was, at a, it made me see the student who is an outsider and who is nervous to walk into another group of people um, who just kind of wants to be noticed and seen. And he gave me um, a heart and ears and eyes for that person. Um, and then he placed me in this job where now that I have like that burden on my heart, he has given me like this new platform to care for them. So um, yeah, he's gracious sometimes to not give us what we want when we want it because he knows that what he offers us in his way um, is so much better. So it's always for our good and for his glory. Um, don't stop trusting that God is gracious and that he's gonna provide for you. Remember that he knows your needs better than anyone and he knows how to best meet those needs. And then patiently and expectantly wait for his grace because it will come. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from Daisy. Um, hey guys, my name is Daisy Salazar. I'm a junior human biology major, and this year I serve as one of the two OCC senators focused on representing students, specifically commuters. As I stand here today, it is difficult for me to have ever imagined that God will use me in my brokenness to highlight his faithfulness and relational being. However, during Tory conference on a Thursday night, the Holy Spirit led me into the acknowledgement of my brokenness in terms of the expectations I've been putting in my life or that were put in my life. I grew up as a firstborn child who for some reason was expected to mature and take care of her two sisters at the age of 10. At the age of 15, I had to continue getting good grades because I was expected to get a higher education and improve my life for the better because my parents had gave it all in order to provide a better future for me here in the US. Meanwhile, I was also expected to continuously improve on my English because that was the main language being used in school and I didn't speak as well as other people thought I should. However, I was also expected to not forget my roots of speaking Spanish because that was the main language that my parents understood. In church, I was expected to read the Bible, pray, and serve within a ministry because that was the only way I thought I could secure heaven. However, although reading the Bible and praying are essential, I treated it more as a checklist and a way to build my relationship with God. This was the list of expectations I felt that I had to continuously accomplish every day, and if I didn't accomplish this list, I was disappointing everyone, especially God. As you can see, this big ball of false expectations began to take a toll on my emotional, physical, and spiritual health. What's even worse is that I wouldn't even allow myself to be helped because I wouldn't show myself as someone who needed help. Um, unconsciously, my experiences with expectations were leading me into a time where I isolated my emotions, my relationships, and even isolated myself from God. Um, it's still funny for me to remember this, but every time I try to run away from God, I always somehow found myself running back to Him. It took two years for me to realize how much of an impact this pain had on me, but even today, I still struggle to embrace and express the pain that accumulated over the years. This is because for the majority of time, I, exp I appear as a happy, cheerful, smiling person, and then if I felt like I could share my true emotions, which were crying and, and desperation, and then the next day, I would resume to be happy and cheerful, people would start seeing me as a hypocrite. So I decided to instead suppress my emotions and continue to be seen as the happy, composed individual that I put out to be. After a while for pleading for help and blaming God for not listening to me, one day he opened my ears to listen and realized that just how he was there present each day, seeing me cry and suffer, he was also there present with those who were surrounding me. Even though it was hard at first, I learned to share my emotions with people who are close to me. This included friends, my boyfriend, and administrators that know me well at Biola. So how does my story apply to you guys? There might be some of you who are broken at this moment and may feel the same frustrations I felt. For others, you might feel the frustration of expectations that are put by yourselves or that are added to you by others. 
or you may perhaps even have the combination of both. The reality is that we all have different stories when it comes to this topic, but we all share and serve one God who's unchangeable. God allows you to feel sadness, anger, and frustration because he is a relational being seeking to build a relationship with you. He uses the pain that you have and turns it into something fruitful in your life that will highlight his character. You might not feel his presence or even feel like he's in fact removing the pain, but he is. Trust me, I will know and you know too. It is so easy to forget his hand at work, but he does not forget his creation. He was there when you were at your lowest, he was there when you were at your highest, and he will always be there even in your moments of doubt. So if anything could be taken away from this story, I would say that one, God possesses the attributes of being faithful and relational throughout our lives. Two, be open to telling your problems to those who are really close to you, but at the same time, do not forget to include God into the situations. And three, suppressing the pain will only make it worse. It may feel awkward or uneasy, but if you take the first step of embracing your pain and sharing it to others, I believe your life can become more fruitful too. Thank you for listening and being part of my journey. Good morning. My name is Christopher Sandino. I'm a sophomore political science major here at Biola, and I'm the current Hope Senator. And today I'll be telling you about my experience with God's love. I came to Biola relatively popular because I was popular in the sense that I had my friends that I could talk to or the separate people groups or even just someone to say a quick hi to in the hallway. Coming to Biola was a great change of environment because I came from a public school. It felt really great to be around fellow Christians where I could talk about my faith and question my faith openly without feeling like that odd man out. However, as good as it was, it was also incredibly difficult to navigate this new environment, putting myself out there, making new friends, getting involved, and the list goes on. My roommate and my best friend from high school, he was doing really well with finding new friends and that place to fit in, and I'll be honest, it made me really jealous. He had so much success in those areas that I just got a totally different result when I did the same thing. There were times when I would even try to like weasel my way into people's conversations during class because I thought that if only they would make conversation with me, they would like me. I prayed and prayed and asked God for help to give me that confidence to be able to step out of my comfort zone and to give me those friends. But I still felt alone, like I had no one to talk to. I had no friends to go to lunch with. I had no uh, weekend trips to the beach. And most important of all, I had no random weeknights at Disneyland. All I wanted to do was relax with my friends back home. And after a while of this, I got disheartened and I wanted to transfer. I wanted to transfer to a school where I knew I wouldn't have as much, I wouldn't struggle as much to feel comfortable or accepted or struggle to readjust the new atmosphere, which I hadn't done before. I'd always been moderately above average at making small talk, but here it felt like everyone was so much better than me at literally everything. And with that, I had accepted defeat and I set my mind on transferring. But then something happened during my interterm Spanish class. I was working on a, class, a few class projects with two of my classmates. They were a bit older than me and I figured we had nothing in common, but it was right there that I found my people. Uh, it started with us just swapping phone numbers to send each other memes during class. And then we actually started to go to lunch afterwards, after classes, and now I'm even dating one of them. <laughs> God gave me my people right there in that gen ed Spanish class. <laughs> which I'll be honest was the last place I would have expected to find my college people group. These are friends that really loved me for me and they made me feel comfortable and like I really belonged here at Biola. Not only did they accept me as their own, but their friends also accepted and loved me too. And now I get to have my crazy weeknights at Disneyland, even though I may have an 8 a.m. in the morning. I started to feel even more confident in being able to step out of my comfort zone, like leaving my room door open when I was just hanging out or talking or making with conversation with people on my floor or even just talking to people during class, I finally felt that my prayers had been answered. I tell you this today because I learned an important lesson about God's love. It was when I felt so alone and unloved by everyone that God showed his unending love for me by putting others in my life to build me up and support me and to just be a friend when I needed one because that's how crazy awesome God's love is. Whenever and wherever we feel the most unloved, God's love is shown in the most extraordinary ways. 
Friends, you are loved. God loves you. Even if you feel like no one is there for you, God is there for you and God loves you. Your presence here on this campus matters and it's okay to put yourself out there and to take a chance. If you feel alone and like no one loves you, there's a good chance that other people feel the same way. And they need your friendship too. And they're just waiting, just like you. Thank you for listening and God bless. Hi everyone, um, my name is Sierra McCoy and I am the SGA Marketing Coordinator this year. Um, I'm also a junior studying business management. So what I do in SGA is I manage pretty much the social media platforms and all newsletter communications. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking to you guys about God's grace. And so if I could title this as a book, um, as this a chapter in a book, I'd call it Perfectly Imperfect. Because if you were to describe my life, it would be seen as perfect. Not in my eyes, not in your eyes, not in my family's eyes, but in God's eyes, my life has been absolutely perfect. Because everything that has happened was intended by him, crafted by him, and created by him. And so, I think, and I, I think back to my life when I started here at Biola, the first, I, I thought these crazy things. Um, I thought that the first guy that was super cute in my accounting class was going to be my husband. I thought that the first two girls I talked to SOS week were going to be my best friends and were gonna be in my wedding. And I thought that eating donuts every single day at 1 a.m. was the best health choice I could have possibly made. Um, but I look back now and I'm like, I was so crazy. What was I thinking? And I thought I knew who I was. I thought I knew who I was going to be um, in my experience here at Biola. But I know that um, God knew exactly who I was walking onto this campus and he laughed when I thought all those things. And so um, it's just been evident to me that there's these things that I came in and I struggled with internally here um, starting. Uh, I am a multiracial first generation college student that had only been a Christian for four years. So with being multiracial, I'm four different races. I'm Filipino, Portuguese, Hispanic, and African American. And it's been such a struggle for me to be able to embrace every single one of my cultures without having to feel like I'm just one and I have to be one and I shouldn't have to be because those four races are who I am. And with being a first generation college student, I remember coming to Biola like, what in the world is the ACT and the SAT? and AKA the ACT and the SAT. And I always felt 10 steps behind absolutely everyone. And just with being a Christian for only four years, I was so intimidated by everything that Biola had to offer. I felt like people were Christians their whole life and I wasn't good enough and I didn't know who God was and I wasn't good enough to be here. And so it's crazy to say that because um, having the honor of serving on SGA for two years has been such a privilege to me because I was obsessed with Biola before I first came here. I was so excited to be here and I'm so excited to be here now. And it's, what, it's the people. This university is of the people and without the people, the staff, the professors, this university wouldn't be what it is. And it's such an honor to be able to serve students through SGA, especially since I'm so obsessed with it and and I'm so obsessed to be here and be at Biola. And so um, I just always felt extremely inadequate and not good enough in all the things that I've struggled with. And so um, this year I've had the pleasure of being first gen mentoring coordinator for our first gen scholars program here at Biola. And so I mentor, influence, and supervise and manage 16 beautiful mentors who have changed my life. Um, every week I have weekly one-on-ones with them and they pour their life into me. They tell me how they are and they're honest. And I felt like I had to be so composed and well-managed and keep myself together, but God has shown me that I need to be absolutely the opposite. I need to be honest with them. I need to tell them that, hey, I'm not at my good state. Let's talk through this. Let's work through this together because I'm not, I'm not doing well myself. And so God has honestly shown me that I need to allow his grace to be in my life and not to be so hard on myself and my inadequacies are actually who I am and that's who's perfected me in his life and what he's wanted for me. And so last year I went to SCORE conference and I went to a workshop and a woman was talking about who we are and who we are as individuals. And she said the quote, um, you are perfect enough for today. And when she said that I was at this place of extreme doubt, like if only you knew that I was not perfect enough for today, let me give you a list of everything that I'm not perfect at. 
And I was able to rest in God's, um, God's plan for me and know that his grace has been covered in my life and that I should not feel like absolutely everything in my life is not perfect enough for him because it already is. And so I wanna encourage you to know that I'm still going through this. I'm still trying to find myself in his grace and that I want you all to know that um, in those days where you feel like you're not good enough and you have a list of things that you can just say that you're not perfect enough in, just to rest in the fact that you are perfect enough for today in God's grace. Thank you. Hello, Viola. My name is Michaela Smith. I am a junior, a cinema and media arts major, and I currently serve as Sigma Senator. Today, I wanna to talk about one of God's attributes that isn't necessarily one that comes to mind right away, his sovereignty. God's sovereignty, sov <laughs> sovereignty, I knew I'd pronounce it wrong, is an integral aspect of his character. It can also be one of the hardest to accept as it humbles us. It reminds us that things are under God's rule and control and that nothing happens without either his direction or his permission. Nothing takes him by surprise. The sovereignty of God is not only that God has the right and power to govern all things, but that he does. While we may see one tiny stroke of a painting, God stands back and sees the entire masterpiece, his big picture. But how does God's sovereignty affect us personally? Raise your hand if you've ever set out a plan for your life and then God has led you a completely different way. Yeah, me too. If you would have told me two years ago that I would be speaking about God's sovereignty in my life at Biola University in California, I would have laughed. My college experience began on the other side of the country in Tennessee. I thought I had my life figured out. This college was the perfect distance away from my Illinois home I was going to get my bachelor degree there and move out to California when I was good and ready. After my first semester, my own plans began to fall apart. For one thing, my major's program got closed, a huge hit to my carefully laid out plan. Around this time, a friend of mine suggested I check out Biola University. I looked at the website thinking that it would stop there. Within the week, I had applied just to see what would happen. I prayed to God thinking there was no way this could be his will, and I stubbornly tried to make a deal with God, which I don't recommend, by the way. I said, I'll go to Viola if you do A, B, and C. As time went on, all those pieces began to fall into place. A was fulfilled, B happened, and C was beyond what I had asked. During this period, my heart slowly changed from one of reluctance to one of desire to see God's will fulfilled, and at Biola. I found myself meditating on God's word and spending time in prayer more than I had in a very long time. After clearing a path for me and sending so many signs my way, I decided to follow God's lead to Biola University. So now I'm 2,000 miles away from home, navigating college as a first-generation student and a transfer. What this means is I'm really out of my element. As a first generation student, my parents can't offer any wisdom about my college experiences. I kind of have to figure that out on my own. Being a transfer, my educational path is different. I struggle to make all my classes fit into my schedule so I can graduate on time, and I always feel behind everyone in my graduating class. I know that many of you face these same challenges or other unique obstacles. Realizing that God ultimately reigns over my life has helped me to know that I can get through these circumstances with his help. I know as college students, we have a lot of fears about what could happen with things like our grades, our finances, our relationships, and our future. I'm comforted to know that I don't have to navigate all of these situations on my own. There's nothing in my life that God doesn't know about. In trials, God refines me. In successes, I rejoice in his gifts and provision. I'm so happy to be here, and I'm so grateful for the work that God is doing in my life. Through my situation of confusion and being unsure about transferring, God oversaw the entire process with his best plan in mind. When things feel out of control for me, even now, I'm comforted by knowing that there's nothing that will enter my life that God does not either decree or allow, and nothing will ever enter your life that he cannot work out for good. 
The God that we pray to has power over the entire universe, over every single atom, and yet he's still infinitely loving and cares about us. Proverbs 19.21 says, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. I had so many expectations of what my college experience would be, but God's plan is turning out to be the best. If your own plans are being turned upside down, be comforted by Romans 8.28, knowing that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. If your life is in the hand of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, our God, know that it is in the best possible of hands. Thank you. Hey, everybody. <laughs> so my name is uh, Greg Ambrose. Um, I guess we're doing majors, so I'm an English major, um, and I am SGA president this year. Um, I'm here to tell you about my story. Uh, five years ago, I graduated from a really small private high school, graduating class of 30, uh, called Lake Mead Christian Academy in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, and like everybody else, you know, you're really excited to make it to graduation. And yet at the same time, uh, it was different for me because unlike all my peers, unlike all my friends, I hadn't really decided what college I was going to yet. When I graduated, I was valedictorian and student body president of my high school, which isn't something I usually like to talk about. Um, but the thing is, if anyone was supposed to have their life planned out, if anyone's expected to make the right decisions, and if anyone was supposed to achieve great things, I felt like it had to be me. I remember how burdensome these expectations felt expectations that I had received from my friends, from my family, from myself especially. Um, I wasn't allowed to fail at all. And in many ways, and I, I feel like I still am not allowed to fail, um, I'm supposed to be the one that makes it big time. I'm expected to, uh, you know, become the one who becomes known for doing something absolutely great and incredible. Truthfully, I was just like everybody else, senior in high school, you're just trying to get through grad, or you know, get through graduation, hopefully pick a good college, and you know, life goes on. Um, but unfortunately, it's never really that simple, and because of this extreme anxiety and indecisiveness I was suffering from, I actually decided to take a year off between high school and college, which felt like a major failure for myself. Um, and as someone who wasn't accustomed to failure, at least not in my mind, that was really difficult. I felt like I was expected to just get through high school, get straight A's, do well on my ACTs, or, or my ACTS, as uh, Sierra would call them. Um, you know, get a big scholarship, head into college, and somehow just breeze through it, right? Into a nice, cushy career. Um, and people would always tell me, Greg, don't take a year off. You're going to be one of those people who never really goes back to school and just kind of wastes your life. Um, so I could just feel these expectations piling on and piling on and piling on. Um, so I felt directionless during that year off, um, not having really a, a plan set out before me. I thought, this isn't what success looks like, right? I'm supposed to just be on this path, and I can't leave it. And if I dare, dare step off of it, uh, there's going to be consequences. So I spent a lot of time that year doubting myself um, as I toured around colleges in California, just praying God would direct me, showing me where he wants me to go. Um, and eventually, you know, I, I toured a lot of colleges like Westmont, uh, Master's College. I drove right past APU. I knew that enough. Um, but for whatever reason, I felt continually drawn back to Biola, um, probably too many times. I came for a university day. I came for a spring preview day. I came once for a private tour. I came for Biola bound. Um, I kind of overdid it. Um, but for whatever reason, you know, I felt being called to Biola and... I was relieved when I finally made that decision, and I moved into Hope Hall. Chris, Senator Hope Hall, what a guy. Uh, moved into Hope Hall 2014, but instantly I felt those expectations and those burdens coming back. Uh, and like many others that have spoken today, I'm a first-gen college student. I'm the oldest in my family. So I'm supposed to be the one, maybe a lot of you can identify with this, you're supposed to sort of embody and exemplify success, right? You're supposed to you know, be this role model for your brothers, the pride of your parents. Um, and it's really hard to describe the sort of enormous weight that seems to hang from your neck when you have no room to fail, or at least you think you don't. 
Um, no room to make a mistake, no room to be anything less than perfect. And you combine that with the kinds of feelings of confusion and, and uncertainty that any freshman feels or any transfer student, any first year student feels coming onto this campus. Uh, and it's not long before you feel completely lost. But thank God that wasn't a place I was gonna be stuck in forever. Biola has a really good way of sort of saturating you in the word and surrounding you with people and presenting you with opportunities. And it wasn't before long, um, I found ways to be successful again and I thought things were gonna be all right again. I got hired as a associated student's first year intern. I still have my little name tag from freshman year to remind me of you know, what I've come from. Um, I went on to be senator the next year um, and I thought, okay, I'm on this path to success again. Things are gonna be okay. Um, but I still remember God telling me in the conversations I had with people uh, in the word, not to sort of root my identity in my successes or achievements because that's frail and fragile and it's not gonna last. That same year, my uh, end of sophomore year, I was asked to run as student body vice president with my friend Carissa Vera. Um, and so I said, hey, what the heck, let's, do, let's, you know, let's go for it. And I tried um, and I failed. And I failed by what felt like a really wide margin of 14% of the vote count. Um, and it was odd because for the first time where I felt like I had really come across true failure in my life, I remember this sort of sense of overwhelming peace that God had set upon me. Um, and I knew that whatever I decided to do moving forward wouldn't come from this deep-rooted need to be successful or this deep-seated fear of being failure anymore. So I ran again the next year, um, and I'm here today. Um, and I just wanna share with you all how important it is to remember not to root your identity in either your successes or your failures at all. Um, for the first time, I felt like I could do something that I was excited to do not just because I felt like I needed to, not because of expectations I had been set upon me by others, by myself, by friends. Um, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, success is a really poor place to root your identity, and as wonderful as it feels, it's a dismal substitute for the God and the identity he promises you in him. So hopefully today you've gotten a really good look at uh, a lot of the stories a lot of students here in SGA have, and hopefully in some ways I, I hope they can remind you of your own, um, the things they share. Each of them is a testament to the beauty of our student body, and there's a million more stories just like them. Their stories, backgrounds, and experiences are richly diverse, and yet they all reveal and emphasize the different incredible qualities of God. I hope that their stories can encourage you to love one another more and help you recognize how beautifully different experiences of God exist to bring us closer to one another through unity in Jesus Christ. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.